and today we are talking about the three major factors that are shaping cinema cameras in 2022, which companies are pursuing which paths and how these capabilities are shaping the ways that we shoot and create. The first big trend in cinema cameras that has been going on for the better part of eight years now is resolution. Uh, red cameras have been pursuing this for a very long time. Blackmagic with their Ursa range and the Ursa Mini are also focusing on this. 10 years ago, everything shot 1080, which is to say 2K. 2K long wise, 1080 pixels high. Then about five or six years ago, there was a 4K revolution where we doubled the, uh, from 2K to 4K, which is actually because it's doubling horizontally and dubbing vertically is a four times increase in the size of the image. Slowly televisions uh, caught up and now most TVs are 4K capable. But because you want some redundancy when you shoot, meaning you wanna be able to crop in on your 4K image, camera companies started producing 6K cameras, then 8K cameras, then 12K cameras. The red Raptor XL is uh, 8K, Canon C500 Mark II is a 6K sensor, a uh, full frame 6K sensor, and the R5C is an 8K sensor. So sensors are getting bigger and bigger, higher and higher resolution, despite the fact that most films are still being delivered and watched in 1080 or 2K. This is because unless you're very, very close to the TV or the TV is very, very big, you can't actually, the human eye can't really tell the difference between 2K and 4K. We shot and mastered The Devil's Fortune in 4K and then when it came time to deliver it to Amazon and iTunes, I was told that they would only accept a 2K file. They would then up -res it for 4K delivery if that's what people wanted to watch. There was a lot of rush for more resolution when it looked like this was the demand for it, but ultimately the demand for 4K is largely in up 4K or fake 4K. It's not really in 4K files. We've sort of hit a roof at 2K and until they're selling 150, 200 inch televisions that you're gonna sit right in front of, that will probably remain the same. It would be different for gaming when you're very close to the screen. It's definitely different for uh, VR. When the screen is only an inch from your eyes, uh, you can definitely tell the difference between uh, 2K and 4K. And because if you wanna do 3D, you need two 4K frames with dual fisheye lens to create VR content that doesn't look pixelated when it's very close to your eye. This is one of the few instances where you actually need 8K. Pretty crazy that for less than $6,000, you can now shoot better 3D than Peter Jackson could with his insane dual prism red camera rig on The Hobbit, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that was only seven, eight years ago. But cameras are gonna keep increasing in resolution because some companies have really bet the farm uh, on resolution like RED. Other companies have worked out that it's a good way to get people to upgrade their cameras. And it's definitely a way to get people to upgrade their televisions, even if that difference isn't that perceivable. I still upload a lot of my YouTube videos in 4K because YouTube wanted to prioritize 4K content. So 4K content helps you get on the front page of YouTube. Whether or not you can actually see the difference is up for debate. The second big trend in cinema camera development is dynamic range, meaning the range of brightness that the camera can capture from the brightest white to the darkest dark. Ari Alexa has just released the RE35, their first sensor in 12 years, and it claims 17 stops of usable dynamic range, which is as much as celluloid as film. Having more dynamic range means you don't have to choose to either crush the background to black or blow out parts of the subject to white. New cameras are able to achieve high dynamic range by using multiple feeds from the same sensor and then applying gain to them and then using computing power in the camera to be able to combine both the high and the low image, the light and the dark, into a complete uh, image with high dynamic range. This is how Canon's DGO sensor works. This is how uh, Alexa's new 4K RE35 works. But like all things, there are diminishing returns. Every, for every extra stop you get, you're getting a doubling uh, of the amount of light it can capture. But each stop costs more money because you need more computing power to uh, combine the two very dissimilar images, which is why the Alexa 35 is gonna be 70, 80, $90,000, depending on where you live and the currency you're buying it in. But it also limits resolution because 
And that's why the Alexa 35, despite being a $80,000 camera, is only 4K. It's not 6K or 8K. There just isn't the computing power available to combine two 8K images, one with high gain, one with low gain, into a high dynamic range image. Don't get me wrong, high dynamic range is extremely useful to have in a camera. I would say much more useful uh, than any resolution past 4K. But in almost all of the situations that you're using a camera in, I would say 90% of them, you can control for that dynamic range, meaning you can bring in more light or you can not try and sh compete with the sun and the shadow. And I personally think that very high dynamic range images, like where you have the actor with their back to the sun and you're trying to expose for the clouds and the actor's face, tend to be very difficult to look at. You don't wanna have that much dynamic range in your shot because the person is really struggling to make out the actor's face against the very bright background. Or the reverse, where you have a very bright actor's face and you wanna hold detail in the background, no one's looking at the background if they're looking at the actor's face. So why do you need information there? I think in a way, video is heading towards 32-bit um, float point audio where no matter what you capture, you can pull something out of it. From the loudest to the lowest sound, you can just bring down the loudest or boost up the lowest. So it means you can never lose information in the camera. You're basically just gonna capture all different light that enters the sensor. You're gonna be able to do that in post. But that is one more job that you have to do in post. I once shot a project that I had to reframe every shot from 4K down to 1080 and it was exhausting. It was just uh, so much more time than we needed to use. We should have just made those choices on set and uh, stuck with them. Now the last trend is really two trends that are combined. It's cost and modularity. This is probably best encapsulated with the uh, Sony Venice 2, which is a very modular camera and even has the sensor that can just come off and different mounts that can go on and off. So you can buy a cheaper Sony Venice 2 with a Super 35 sensor in it, but then if you wanted to shoot full frame or 65, uh, you can just rent that sensor for the day for your camera, slot it in and shoot on those larger sizes so basically there are there is a core brain of the camera and then there are all these other parts that are not third party that are actually part of the manufacturer's camera system that you can either buy or rent and deck the camera out with when you need them to. This means that you can have a fully built out, very expensive camera for big jobs. You can have a very stripped down camera for small jobs and you can buy the brain and own it and then rent the other things as you need them, which is a really flexible way uh, for filmmakers and cinematographers uh, to own their own gear without having to buy everything. So which way will Canon go in this resolution, modularity, uh, dynamic range battle? Well, there was a very interesting rumor that came out that there would be two new C700s. There would be one with super high resolution, 8K or 12K, and then there would be one with a very high 20 plus stops of dynamic range that was only 4K. I think this is a really sensible way to go because not everyone has the same desires and I think it's silly to try and pack everything into one premium camera that people have to pay for but don't want to use. It's sort of similar to the Phantom camera um, that shoots not particularly high resolution and not particularly great dynamic range, but it shoots a million frames per second. So it's a specialist camera that you rent if you're doing high speed. Not very many people own one because they're uh, tens of thousands of dollars, uh, but you can rent it for one shot or one scene. That is my look at the three technologies currently shaping the future of cinema cameras. If you have a Canon cinema camera and you wanna get a better result with it, check out Canon Masterclass. I have a ton of in-depth courses there on all the Canon cinema cameras, as well as lighting production, gear management, feature films, and everything in between. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you next time.